And he established or reestablished the Hebrew language that had been dead for over 2,000 plus years. He, you go to Israel, his name is all over the place. Ben Yehuda Street here, Ben Yehuda Street there, Ben Yehuda this and that. Because Ben is son, Yehuda is Judah. So he's the son of Judah. Anyway, he was probably from the tribe of Judah, maybe not. But uh, anyway, this guy alone, almost single-handedly, resurrected the language, and that goes to, I think I might have quoted this in this class, I might not have, in the book of Zephaniah. It says, I will restore to the people a pure lip, meaning a pure language. And it was fulfilled. They are now again speaking the language of Hebrew, which had been dead for all those years, except as a, think of it this way, and this will help you understand. They used it in the synagogues. What is it that the Catholic Church did up almost until modern times as far as their liturgy. Yeah. Latin. 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 That's right. Nobody spoke Latin and, except the priests and a few elite. And so what did that do that allowed them to have control over the people? Okay, that's just the way it was. I mean, very, very recent change. Very recent change. Now they allow different school. languages. That's right. When I was still yeah. in school, a lot of my Catholic friends all took Latin. Yeah, because they wanted to understand the catechism. But the people that didn't take it, they just sat in church and they didn't know what was saying. And that's to show you the parallel is that that is what has been going on in the, the synagogues for all these thousands of years. And so the people in the synagogue that knew the Hebrew were pretty much the only ones that really knew what was going on. Everybody else just, they, I'm sure that they spoke their language, uh, you know, like German or, or Russian or whatever in the synagogue, but for the liturgy is what I'm saying. And so it kind of made a, 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 a and I, I, I don't want to use the word bondage, but kind of a bondage on the fact that the people were not aware of all of the intricacies of what was going on. The same as the Latin. If you don't know the language, you are up to whatever they say. That's all. And so, um, uh, anyway, that's just a comparison so you can understand what's going on. But, um, Abib. All that from Abib. Sorry about that. Okay, go ahead. Five. And it shall be when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service of the, in the month. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. So okay. You've got to run on since. Uh, it's a very long sentence. That's right. You know, the longest sentence in the Old Testament, I believe, is in the book of Esther. Real long one. Real long one. Um, I, I may be wrong on that, but I do believe it is. Um, here is what he is saying. He's saying that, you know, when I take you into this land, and he clearly identifies, I believe, seven tribes. One, two, three, four, five. Uh, five tribes at this time. Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Hivites, and Jebusites. At other times, he's going to give six. At other times, he's going to give eight. Sometimes he gives seven. All right? He's just giving a general statement. It's not something that, oh, well, that's a contradiction. It's not. He's saying this is the land, and if you use those and observe them, uh, Acts. I think it's an Acts where... Um, Stephen, I may be wrong on this, but I think Stephen says, well, there were seven tribes. Somewhere it says that, but let me check real quickly, and then uh, if I'm wrong, I'll know within a couple seconds here. Um, uh, but it does say this elsewhere. It says seven tribes were overthrown and blah, 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 but hang on. Egypt, suffer the Egyptians, stood there fighting at this age. Angel of the Lord and Moses, okay. Um, okay, I, I don't see it, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking for it, but it does say uh, somewhere specifically seven tribes, I believe, or seven people uh, in the New Testament. But it, like I say, sometimes it'll say five names, sometimes it'll say six names or eight names or whatever. But um, uh, signs in the land of Egypt. Okay. Um, but if you go to Leviticus 23, and you don't need to go there, but here he's mandating this particular feast. He's mandating the Passover feast. Okay, and I will read it to you. Leviticus 23 is what we're doing out at the, the, the beach right now. Um, that is the actual instruction for the eight feasts of the Lord. And without looking, can anybody say what the eight feasts of the Lord are? Anybody? Okay, the first one really is debatable because a lot of people don't include it in the Feast of the Lord, but it's mentioned there. And then he says, these are your feasts again. So some people skip the first one, but it's the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a weekly, ongoing feast to the Lord. The second one is the Passover, first one of the year. 
And then you have the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And that's, those are both in what we just read. That, the, that sentence that you just read is the Passover and Unleavened Bread. And sometimes they are called together the Feast of Unleavened Bread, such as in the New Testament. I think Luke does that. Or sometimes people will call it the Passover. They're conjoined. The first day is the Passover. The next seven days are the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And people will join them together in their terminology. All right. After that, you have the Feast of First Fruits, Picture of the resurrection. Okay. The next one is the Feast of Pentecost, or as they say in Hebrew, Shavuot. It's the Feast of Weeks. Okay. You count off the weeks, seven weeks, and then you have the fiftieth day, which where our terminology comes from, Pentecost. Pentecost. Okay. Fifty. Um, and then from there you have what are called the Fall Feasts. You have three Fall Feasts. You've got Rosh Hashanah, okay, or Yom Teruah, the Day of Trumpets. Then you have Yom Kippur which is the Day of Atonement, and then you have the Feast of Tabernacles, okay? In, those are all designated, all eight of those feasts are designated in Leviticus chapter 23, and the Passover is given specifically. So, you just read, I'll read it to you again, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and no leavened bread shall be seen among you, nor shall be seen among you in your quarters, okay? This is what it says in Leviticus 23. It says, um, uh, where are we? On the 14th day of the first month at twilight is the Lord's Passover. We already went through that. and we, it, it specifically said the 14th day about a chapter ago. They're leaving on the 14th day. And then it says, and on the 15th day of the same month, the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. Okay? And then it says, on the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work, but you shall offer an offering. And it goes on from there. So that is specifically saying in Leviticus what has already specifically been said in Exodus. You're going to do this. It's repeated. This is something the Lord wants done. And the reason why is because it pictures the work of Jesus Christ. What is God doing when he brings the Israelites out of Egypt? What is that called? What, there's a word. What, Exodus, but it, there's a word. It is their re, redemption. They're being redeemed from the land of Egypt, right? Okay? And Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb. He is our redeemer. Okay? So it's the same symbolism. And if you go, believe it or not, you go to the, uh, the account. I mean, it's like 1,500 years to the exact day that Christ was crucified that this happened. Okay? And then... Um, 1,500 years to the exact day. We're going to see in a couple more chapters that they, where do they go when they leave here? They first stop at a, a place called the, the sea, the Red Sea, right? And then where do they go after they get through the Red Sea? Where is where's it they go to? Canaan. Well, before that, they stop somewhere to get something. God is going to give them something. The what? No, they're, they're, they're specifically going somewhere. God is taking them somewhere. Ten Commandments. God is going to give them the gift of the Torah, which are the first five books of the Bible. Remember he said to Moses, he said, this shall be assigned to you. Back in Exodus 3, this shall be assigned to you. You shall worship on this mountain. He is going to bring them back. That was 50 days after the Passover. Pentecost. So 50 days after the Passover, they received the law. 50 days after Christ's resurrection, we received the new law. Remember they rejected the law, the people, Moses is up receiving the law, and they went did what? They did what at the base of the mountain? They made a golden calf, golden calf and 3,000 died. Remember, 50 days later, 3,000 people were saved at the, uh, uh, what do you call it, the uh, Pentecost in the temple. So you see what's happening. Paul says, the spirit, I'm sorry, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. The letter of the law is being received on Mount Sinai. They're disobeying, 3,000 die. The letter of the Spirit is given and 3,000 are saved. So God is showing the superiority of the law of Jesus over the law of Moses. Okay, see the parallels? That's what's going on there. And we're getting a little ahead of there, but it is everything is so perfectly connected in this book that it is astonishing. It's just astonishing. As I said, you got the golden bull there, and then 3,000 people die at, uh, 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 what do you call almost 3,000 at the uh, uh, Twin Towers, and down at the bottom there's a golden bull. God takes our, our lives, and he weaves things together. Yeah, 
It's just, yeah, it's like the, the false god. I mean, we're just going back to where we were at, at the law. We're giving up on the spirit of Christ, and we're going back to doing things we shouldn't be doing. So anyway, these parallels are all through history, too, but the Bible is so perfectly woven together when you look at it. The dating, the precision of it is just incredible. Okay, so wherever we were, I think it was seven or eight? Seven. Okay. Seven? Yeah. <coughs> the unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days. And no leavened bread shall be eaten among you, nor shall leaven be seen among you in all your quarters. Okay, why is it that there's no leaven? I think I mentioned this before. But yeast is sin. Yeast is a picture of sin, and uh, it, is, it is not, I don't want to say it's not necessary, but it is not, we are sinless because of Christ. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 5, purge out the old leaven because you are truly unleavened bread. And it never specifically says in the New Testament that you can't use leavened bread for the, for the uh, communion or the Lord's Supper. But you can imply it. And so when you go to a church, like I attended the Methodist church over here and um, uh, St. John's, no, not St. John's, um, Trinity, Trinity United. I attended there before I you know, right after I met the Lord. And every week they would have a big loaf of bread. They wouldn't have unleavened bread. The symbolism is not right. It never specifically says you can't use a loaf of bread in the Bible, in the New Testament. But we want to stick to proper symbolism. And proper symbolism is that Jesus, we are celebrating his crucifixion, we are celebrating his sinless life, which is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, to the Lord, all right. So it only makes sense that we would use unleavened bread, bread without yeast, in our honoring of the Lord. Okay, That's just my personal opinion. Other people are going to disagree with that. But I don't see any reason why you should insert something into our tradition which is not based on something from the Bible. Okay, So if you're in a church and they serve bread that's you know, got leaven in it, I wouldn't stand up and walk out, but you may go to the pastor afterward and say, you know, the symbolism is very clear. Think it over and, you know, have, have a reason to support what you're saying. Does everybody got what I'm saying here? All right. I, I'm not saying that it is... It's not legalism. It's... Thank you. That's what I'm trying to say without being a, a, a legalistic person because some people will say, I'm leaving this church. They have leavened bread in here. Whatever. There's no point in being that way. But at the same time, we do want to honor the Lord as closely as possible. What's that? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh. That's actually a more reasonable reason why people would leave the church than a lot of the reasons they do leave. The oh, I know. You know, what, if people, one of the questions I had, seeing as how you brought that up, one of the questions I had about, uh, I interviewed that old Jewish guy for my college paper, and uh, he said, well, I, I got a question for you. I said, yeah. He said, why are there so many denominations? And I said, because some people want to sit down when they pray, and some people say we should stand up when we pray. And he says, well, that sounds right, because I guess the same thing in the Jewish synagogues. They got Reform, they got Orthodox, and they got the, you know, everybody's got their little pet peeves, and it's nothing. It's human. It's human. And why on earth would we do this? Why? You know, why are we going to divide a church over something so silly? But you know what I tell people when they ask that? The Lord knew this was going to happen. In some way, His purposes are being effected by our silliness. Another church is being built. Another person may come into a church that may not have ever gone to a particular location. Whatever reason, we have a billion denominations, and as long as they are doctrinally holding to the Bible and the person of Jesus Christ, I couldn't care diddly if they stand up or if they kneel or if they sit down when they pray. If they have modern music or if they have the warbler organ, whatever. I, it makes no difference to me. All I know is that I want to worship Jesus Christ. What's that? I think it's Wurlitzer. <laughs> well, no, Warbler is over at Temple Baptist, and that's why I brought that up. I like that one. I hate the Warbler organ. Oh, boy. Oh, you know that? Oh, it's the worst sound in the world. They st I, as far as I know, they still use that at Temple Baptist. That's where I was for three or four years. Horrible sound. The Wurlitzer is kind of fun. It's like... Duh, 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 duh. Oh, that Warbler is just... Oh, I, I mean, I, I just pull out my gun and shoot me now. 